Hello to everyone. Welcome to all of you. Global White. This is your pastor, Yeti. Today I start a new podcast on the paths to power. Living in the Spirit's fullness. The way to a greater spiritual power for many of us, or as I just said in the path to power living in the spirit's fullness, intimates each major idea may be a path leading to a life of un, uh, ab abundant grace promised in the sacred word. And let us remind and remember that a path is merely a way toward something. It can never be the thing itself. A knowledge of the truth is not enough. The truth must be followed if we would realize in actual experience the blessedness which is here that we uh, open now our new study. So, as I said, I invite you, and this is again, many things were given to you to think about. And our first podcast is Power in Action. The greatest event in history was the coming of Jesus Christ into the world to live and to die for mankind. The next greatest event was the going forth of the church to embody the life of Christ and to spread the knowledge of his salvation throughout the earth. It was not an easy task which the church faced when she came down from that upper room to carry on the work of a man who was known to have died, to have died as criminals die, and more than that, to persuade others that this man had risen again from an, the dead and that he was the son of God and Savior. This mission was, in the nature of it, doomed to failure from the start. Who would credit such a fantastic story? Who would put faith in one whom society had condemned and crucified? Left to herself, the church must have perished as a thousand abortive sex had been done before her and have left nothing for a future generation to remember. That the church did not so perish was due entirely to the miraculous element within her. That element was supplied by the Holy Spirit who came at Pentecost to empower her for her task for the church was not an organization, merely, not a movement, but a walking incarnation of spiritual energy. And she accomplished within a few brief years such prodigies of moral conquest as to leave us wholly without an explanation apart from God. In short, the church began in power, moved in power, and moved just as long as she had power. When she no longer had power, she dug in for safety and sought to 
conserve her gains. But her blessings were like the manna. When they tried to keep it overnight, it bred worms and stank. So we have had monasticism, scholasticism, institutionalism, and they have all been indicative of the same thing, absence of spiritual power. In church history, every return to New Testament power has marked a new advanced somewhere, a fresh proclamation of the gospel, an upsurge of missionary zeal, and every diminution of power has seen the rise of some new mechanism for conservation and defense. If this analysis is reasonably correct, then we are today in a state of very low spiritual energy. For it cannot be denied that the modern church has dug in up to her ears and is struggling desperately to defend the little ground she holds. She lacks the spiritual insight to know that her best defense is an offense. And she is too languid to put the knowledge into effect if she had it. If we are to advance, we must have power. Paganism is slowly closing, closing in on the church. And her only response is an occasional drive for one thing or another, usually money, or a noisy but timid campaign to improve the morals of the movies. Such activities amount a little more than a slight twitching of the muscles of drowsy giant to sleepy to care. These efforts sometimes reach the headlines, but they accomplish little that is lasting and are soon forgot. The church must have power. She must become formidable, formidable, a moral force to be reckoned with if she would regain her last position of spiritual ascendancy and make her message the revolutionizing, conquering thing as it once was. Since power is a word of many uses and misuses, let me explain what I mean by it. First, I mean spiritual energy of sufficient voltage to produce great saints once again, that breed of mild, harmless Christian groan in our generation is but a poor sample of what the grace of God can do when it operates in power in the human heart. The emotionless act of accepting the Lord, practicing among us, bears little resemblance to the whirlwind conversions of the past. We need a power that transforms, that fills the soul with a sweet intoxication that will make a former persecutor to be beside himself with the love of Christ. We have today theological saints who can and must be proved to be saints by an appeal to the Greek original. We need saints whose lives proclaim their sainthood, and we need not run to the concordance for authentication. And secondly, I mean a spiritual unction that will give a heavenly unction to our worship, that will make our meeting places sweet with the divine presence. In such a holy place, showy servants and streamlined personalities, while we all add of order a very grief to the Holy Spirit. 
and the emphasis will fall where it belongs upon the Lord himself and his message to mankind. Then I mean the heavenly quality which marks the church as a divine thing, the greatest proof of our weakness in these days is that there is no longer anything terrible or mysterious about us. The church has been explained the surest evidence of her fall. We now have little that cannot be accounted for by psychology and statistics. In that early church, they met together on Solomon's porch, and so great was the sense of God's presence that no man dust join himself to them. The world saw fire in that bush and stood back in fear, but no one is afraid of ashes. Today they dare come as close as they please. They even slap the professed bride of Christ on the back and get coarsely familiar. If we ever again impress unsaved men with the wholesome fear of the supernatural, we must have one more, once more, the dignity of the Holy Spirit. We must know again that all inspiring mystery which comes upon men and churches when they are full of the power of God. Again, I mean that effective energy which God has, both in biblical and in post-biblical times, released into the church and into the circumstances surrounding her, surrounding her, I mean, which made her fruitful in labor and invincible before her foes. Miracles? Yes, when and where they were necessary. Answers to prayers? special providence, all of these and more. It is all summed up in the words of the evangelist Mark. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the words with signs following. The whole book of Acts and the noblest chapters of church history since New Testament times are but an extension of that verse. Such words as those in the second chapter of Hebrews stand as a rebuke to the unbelieving Christians of our day. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. A cold church is forced to interpret such language. She cannot enter into it, so she explains it away. Not a little juggling is required, and not a few statements for which there is no scriptural, scriptural authority. But anything will be, will do the safe face and justify or have that condition. Such defensive exegesis is that a refuge for unbelieving orthodoxy, a hiding place for a church too weak to stand. No one with a knowledge of the facts can deny the need for supernatural aid in the work of world evangelization. We are so hopelessly outclassed by the world's superior strength that for us it means either God's help or sure defeat. The Christian who goes out without faith in wonders will return without fruit. No one dare be so rash as to seek to do impossible things unless he has first been empowered by the God of the impossible. The power of the Lord was there, 
is our guarantee of victory. Lastly, by power, I mean that divine afflatus which moves the heart and persuades the hearer to repent and believe in Christ. It is not eloquence, it is not logic, it is not argument, it is not any of these things, though it may accompany any or all of them. It is more penetrating than thought, more disconcerting than conscious, more convincing than reason. It is a subtle wonder that follows anointed preaching, a mysterious operation of spirit on spirit. Such power must be present in some degree before anyone can be saved. It is the ultimate enabling without wit, which the most earnest seeker must fall short of true saving faith. Everything else being equal, we shall have as much success in Christian work as we have power. No more and no less. Lack of fruit over a period argues lack of power as certainly as the sparks fly upward. Outward circumstances may hinder for a time, but nothing can long stand against the naked power of God. As well try to fight the jagged lightning as to oppose this power when it is released upon man. Then it will either save or, dis or destroy. It will give life or bring death. You shall receive power. It's God's promise and God's provision. The rest waits on us. So what you hear now Maybe you feel offended. Well, that is not my case to bring here. I'm not here to criticize or judgmental. I'm here to reveal some stuff that probably can be much of use as looking at ourselves and looking at our church. What is there to change? Why is there less of power? Why is there less and so on and so on? That's my case. I'm here to spread love and to spread the word, not to push people away. And sometimes it will happen that of your true belief in Christ, that people maybe push you away. Well, that's not wrong, because the reason why they do it is maybe because they do not understand and making as you are a fool. But that doesn't matter. Let us pray for those who are still waiting to enter the kingdom of God. It's a matter of the heart. And where your heart is, let them come in to receive. May God bless you. And may his light shine upon you and keep you safe. Have a wonderful day. This is your pastor, Abby. Bye-bye.